Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blanks and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC Television Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Casey. <clears throat> so, I hope everyone is having a wonderful day today. So, we have four segments lined up, and as usual, for the beginning of the week, we'll be starting off with Falcon and the Winter Soldier, followed by the final three episodes of The Queen's Gambit. We'll kind of be doing a little bit review, and I'll be talking about, you know, some of my initial thoughts while watching the episodes. Then, I would like to take a turn to Home Economics, uh, which is a new sitcom that kind of caught my attention and I was actually surprised with how well uh, the pilot episode was done so I kind of want to dive into that and then we will end it with episode two of The Circle. So starting off we will be talking about Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So um, the episode starts off pretty much uh, minutes, moments, however long after the last episode. Um, You know, it didn't really dawn on me when I was watching the last episode, but it's really interesting that throughout all 23 Marvel movies, throughout all, like, 12 Marvel shows... And, you know, people getting, you know, smashed up and demolished by, you know, super-powered, you know, heroes. And and even some of the heroes fighting other heroes. I think the death of Battlestar was probably the first time, at least that I can think of, in Marvel history where somebody died through pretty reasonable or or, uh, realistic circumstances. He was punched so hard at the chest, thrown like 50 to 100 feet into a pillar so hard that the pillar actually cracked. And with that, you know, given that his back hit the pillar and it hit really hard, he probably broke his spine, his neck, Uh, we saw a little blood out of his mouth. I mean, it's just kind of crazy, you know, you think about all these movies and shows, and let's take uh, Maria, uh, for instance, in the WandaVision show. Wanda threw her so hard over, I don't know, thousands? Yeah, I would definitely say thousands of feet, maybe even tens of thousands of feet. She literally broke through a shelf, a wall, a fence, God knows what other walls and barriers. And then, not only that, but she flew outside of the hex from what looked to be, I would maybe probably say, um, like really felt like 50 plus feet in the air and then dropped into a field. Maria is completely normal. Well, at least at that point, she was a completely normal human being. She should be dead. I mean, if somehow the breaking through walls and stuff did not kill her, 
Um, the fact that she literally was dropped like 50 plus feet into a field after being thrown like, like 50 plus miles per hour, like she should have been decimated. She should have been severely injured, but more specifically, she should have been dead. So just a little tidbit, you know, that I was thinking when I started watching this episode, just, I think it's the first time we really actually got some sort of, you know, death like that or realistic injury because most of these people seem to pretty much walk away unscathed. Um, but I don't know. What do you expect from Hollywood? You know, it's all about, uh, whatever they could use for the plot. And, um, so anyway, that whole thing aside, uh, the show takes place or the show starts off or this episode starts off right after the end of the last episode. You know, we got a really, really intense fight, uh, a fight that we haven't, a fight that intense we haven't actually really seen in, in a while, even in the Marvel movies. I mean, yeah, some of the fights were on the bigger side, but that was a very intense, a very passionate, a very emotional fight scene that we got in that warehouse. Now, I was really hoping John would just kind of grab the shield and run. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't blame John because clearly they never wanted John to have, I mean, he, sh I did not want him to kill anyone and that's kind of what it seemed like it was gearing up to. But I mean, as was, as we've also seen in these movies and shows so many times, people will literally get that shield flung at their head at like a hundred miles per hour and it just knocks them out. So who knows? Maybe he wasn't going to actually really kill Sam, but I believe that's what they were kind of implying. But, um, anyway, yeah, really cool fight scene, really liked it, uh, Sam and Bucky were definitely trying to take the shield from him, um, which, that, it almost, to me, and I know that was not the intention, but to me it almost felt like they're more worried about trying to get the shield versus stopping him, but... But yeah, um, it's just funny though, they, they take this big morally high ground against John. But, I mean, this is another thing about these movies. If, th if these movies were realistic, and yes, I know they're movies, or, and even the TV shows too, but like, if any of these things were realistic, all of these people would have killed dozens of people. I mean, Sam was in the military, he was in the Air Force, Bucky was in the military, and he's the Winter Soldier, you know? So, they've definitely killed a lot of people. Um... They were in a battle against super soldiers. Now, granted, what he did was a little above and beyond um, what should have happened, but it was the heat of the battle, and there is a war, you know? And these people have already killed, more so Carly's killed them, but even so, this whole they're still a part of this whole resistance. So, I mean, we as the audience know that Carly killed them, but as the rest of the world's concerned, they are the ones, the resistance itself is the one that killed those people. So, just really funny that they take this high, high, you know, moral ground, um, especially given that Captain America and the rest of them, you know, were on the run for all these years, and they weren't listening to the world governments in, you know, the so uh, Sokovia Accords, which I felt like made perfect sense, especially after happened after what happened in Sokovia. But anyway. So, um, so yeah, awesome opener, very cool fight scene. I feel like I'm probably the only person in the world who even thinks this, but I actually really like John Walker. I think I like John Walker more than any of the other characters in this show, with maybe the exception of Zemo. I have really grown to like Zemo, and I know we are not done with him. Which actually, let me actually get to the Zemo storyline, because it was very, very quick. So obviously he had his biggest escape in the last episode, and then this episode, his only one scene that he was in was he was at the Sokovia uh, memorial statue in which Bucky was there, and he pulled his gun out and tried to fake shoot him. But uh, before he even did that, you know, Zemo was like, there's only one way to deal with Carly, and that's kill her. Um, which, to an extent, I think I agree. I think she is probably a little too radicalized, you know, She's beyond the point of 
reason or redemption. Uh, I don't even exactly blame Carly and what she's doing because it is a pretty messed up thing that they're doing, especially given that most of those people, those refugees, they lived in these countries for five plus years, and now they're all just being kicked out and sent to a, a place that's not even really their home anymore, or maybe wasn't even their home really to begin with. So it is a little messed up. But anyway, uh, then we have the Dore Malage. Uh, oh, wait, was that the name of it? I gotta flip back to my notes. Yeah, the Dora Malage. Um, they finally apprehended Zemo. Um, and they took him to Wakanda, and they are taking him to a special prison. But once again, I don't think we've seen the end of Zemo. In this show, maybe, but I think that was a big setup for a future movie. Uh, we got to see Sam ditch the wings, which was really interesting. Um, you know, they were busted up, but those were like his pride and joy for, for quite some time. You know, it was that moment in the show where you knew he was thinking about taking the mantle of Captain America. We also got to see a sort of disgraced John Walker, and I feel like the reaction to John Walker was very much what the American government probably would have done, even if they would have completely understood his actions. Um, he got other than honorably discharged, which actually never knew was even a thing, um, because I've only heard of honorably discharged or dishonorably discharged. So, very, very interesting to see that. Uh, but he was literally stripped of everything. He was stripped of his benefits, his retirement, uh, which was a shame. Because I feel like when there's a war, you know, or there's a battle, if someone dies, like, even if he was Captain America and he was being held to a higher standard, like, I feel like that was pretty, that would have been pretty typical you know, if there's a bunch of government um, soldiers and they, they killed someone, even if they did it in, in the public. But I guess that was just making an example out of him. Uh, we also got this really weird Julia Louis-Dreyfus moment. Um, it felt really out of place. Like, she was playing this wacky, zany character. Um, it just did not fit the tone of what this show has been so far. It didn't fit the tone of the scene at the time. Um, but she's got, like, the blue streak in her hair, so you know she's zany, you know. But anyway, it's just really weird, just everything that she was doing. Um, but she will clearly be someone who I'm sure we'll see again, and who knows, we might even see her in the movies as well. Cut do doubt that. I'm kind of just thinking she might stick around for the TV shows, though. Um, but yeah, uh, I think we'll definitely see her next episode. And I also believe that next episode is supposed to be the finale, which is freaking crazy. Because it was only episode 5, and I guess there's only 6 episodes. Although I thought there was originally 8, but I think it was like last week when I said that I ended up finding out that it was um, 6. So, we also had, you know, some scene, a scene with Isaiah, you know, the uh, black super soldier. Um, love to hear that backstory. Uh, it was really sad, and I think it it is also a very real scene. And I know some people, which is, in my opinion, kind of ridiculous, but some people complained, you know, about the, like, racial discussions in this show. But you really do have to think about the reality of the world we live in today. And in part, that reality does exist within the Marvel Universe. Everything is not always hunky-dory, obviously. You know, there are other things in in that world, in our world, than these big alien, cyborg, you know, whatever threats. So I think it was a very real conversation to hear. It's also a conversation that I'll be briefly discussing in the next segment with the Queen's Gambit. Um, but I, I actually really enjoyed um, hearing that conversation. I ended up hearing, I really enjoyed hearing that backstory, and um, I think it's very possible that if and when he does take up the mantle of Captain America, there will be some hesitation. Um, so yeah, I, I actually really enjoyed that scene. Um, I was really, you know, I really did enjoy some of these action sequences. I mean, they're pretty entertaining. They're really well done. I love, love, love seeing Falcon's fight scenes because the way that he fights with the suit is very impressive at that. 
Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, w- I wanted to get more of the in-depth character, you know, the, the character development, because that's what really makes these shows great. Not only from, in my opinion, a subjective standpoint, but also that is what actually makes it great from an objective standpoint, is well-rounded characters. Now, Sam, for me, he's too much of a, uh, you know, too much of a hero, you know, he's having his own dilemmas, but his dilemmas are an issue of perspective, um, in my opinion, not really uh, him being of a flawed character, which I think is in part why I do like the characters of John Walker and Zemo. And like I said, you know, John Walker, uh, Russell Wyatt, who plays him, he's got... Russell Wyatt? Russell Wyatt. I might actually be thinking about Ozark. Um, something Wyatt. Oh my goodness. But anyway, um, that's why he's been getting all these death threats is because people hate his character so much. But um, but yeah, I, I prefer the flawed characters. So yeah, we got we got more of um more of a, you know, personal development and uh Sam goes home and he meets up with his family and they have these weird like sitcom y tropes and these weird little gags and montages and and all of this stuff it is just very like this episode was both good and bad in my opinion it just felt very out of place but anyway they fixed the boat up they didn't they they decided not to sell it then we also had these really weird but somewhat humorous i i found found it somewhat humorous but also at the same time a little um cringeworthy and eye rolling uh between bucky and sarah um, so I guess something might happen between the two of them. Um, we also got a Sharon scene in which she was talking to someone, someone who was speaking French, which George St. Pierre, the UFC fighter who also played the villain in the first episode, spoke French. So I think that just is going to be that Sharon is the broker, the power broker, and he is going to team up with Carly and them, but when the time is right, he's going to kill Carly because the power broker is very upset about that. Uh, Flag Smashers rose up, and they're trying to start their overthrowing of the vote in New York. Um, very interesting, all in all. Um, pretty good episode. I'm very, like I said, pretty good episode, but also some pretty bad parts, mostly, you know, tonally speaking. Um, I did love the John Walker um uh, scenes with Battlestar's family, although the sister doesn't really seem to believe because they really focused on her and she didn't quite seem upset. She seemed skeptical, but then she seemed upset once John left. We know John's making a shield based off the post credit scenes. I hope John is here to stick around and I would love, love, love to see him in the movies. Please bring him back. So I'm sure we are about to hit a very explosive finale. Um, but that's just kind of my two cents about it all. But we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be talking about The Queen's Gambit, episodes 5 through 7, which is the end of the miniseries. Want to know the latest and hottest music hidden the airwaves? Don't be left out. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Music Podcast. Keith keeps you on the loop with everything you need to know from pop, rock, hip-hop, and the top 40. And we'll throw in news of your favorite artists, concert and tour dates, and so much more. Listen no further, because this is the gold standard in music podcast. All right, and we are back. So we just finished our first segment in which we talked about Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Now we're going to shift gears to talk about the final three episodes of The Queen's Gambit. So last podcast, we had talked about episodes one through four. So now, as I just said, we'll be talking about the final three episodes, so five through seven. So... In episode four, we saw um, Beth was in Mexico, and uh, her mom, you know, was having a pleasant little vacation, and then she passed away, never getting to see any of Beth's matches. 
So um, Beth had a conversation with her mom's technically her ex-husband, although they were still legally married. And um, he agreed to, you know, keep the house um, and he wouldn't kick her out. You know, she'll just pay the rent on it and that'll be that. So Beth returns home and realizes that her life is so empty. She doesn't have any friends. She no longer has her adoptive mother and she just has her passion for chess, really. Um, but luckily, there is a knock at the door, and it is Harry Beltic, who, as uh, as some of you should remember, back in episode two, when Beth was at her uh, very first chess tournament, that was the person she was supposed to beat for the uh, state championship. Uh, or not supposed to, she did beat him for the state championship. He was played by the guy who played Dudley, um, in the Harry Potter movies. So he arrives, um, to, uh, you know, kind of talk to her and, uh, you know, offer her his support, although he doesn't come outright and say it. Uh, he was starting school in the area and he was going to be starting a new job and moving into his apartment. But I guess also given that it was a new area for him, I guess he was kind of hoping to have a friend. So he was there to drop off some books, and they get to talking, and we kind of saw instances of this before, but this is the first instance in which it was really talked about, that while Beth is a genius, um, and she's very quick to learn things, she has her blind spots, and I think one of her blind spots, um, although it doesn't, they don't actually address it in the show, but it's the first time you really like kind of see it in dialogue, is that she can learn from her mistakes, but even with people that are lesser chess players, there can she can still learn something from them. And uh, she kind of needs to bounce strategy off of people. So, for instance, Harry Beltic is definitely a lesser player than Beth. Significantly lesser. Um, but he still has lots of advice. So he brings a, like a slew of books over and she's actually read most of them. So they start talking and um, she gets him to stay the night and they end up sleeping together. Um, which for Harry, I mean, I think he's kind of had a crush on her for a while. Uh, which is a little weird because I think he was a full grown adult when he first met her and she was like 16. Um, now, I mean, she's somewhere around 19 years old, and he's probably in his, like, mid-20s, if I had to guess. Um, although I think the actor in real life is definitely way older than mid-20s. He's got to be, like, his early 30s. Um, he also fixed his teeth, which was kind of cool, because um, they, you know, really focused on those teeth shots in the episode that he was in before. So anyway, um, he ends up moving in with her, and they have this they have this relationship um, that I'd say, in a sense, was casual, but they both kind of want to about their lives, and, you know, they slept together a couple times, and like I said, he kind of became a mentor, uh, really the first, aside from Mr. Scheibel, it's really the first uh, mentor that she's had in the chess field, um, but Harry quickly realizes that Beth has a lot of issues. She is very, very clearly obsessed with chess, understandable. She's got, she feels as if she has nothing left in her life, or else in her life, um, and he, I think he comes to the realization that, you know, there, there is no relationship because she's also, um, aside from her obsession with chess, she also has, you know, an addiction to, uh, pills and she drinks really heavily at that too. Um, and I think it's kind of the first time, um, that I really thought it in the show, but there is, um, this feeling that Beth's story might be one of, uh, ch uh, you know, a tragic character, um, you know, almost past repeating itself. We don't have the full details of everything that went on with her real birth mom, but obviously that ended tragically as her mom tried to not only kill herself, but kind of killed Beth in, or tried to kill Beth in the process when she was nine years old. So Harry kind of leaves her life. Um, I don't think it's good for him. And, uh, you know, so he offers some advice about, you know, what's going to happen to you? 
in a couple years, if you continue on the route that you're continuing on, you're going to become the world's greatest chess player. And then what? Nothing. You've literally achieved your life's dreams by the age of like 22, 23, 24 maybe. And um, then you'll just spend your whole life maintaining your title until someone else comes along who's bigger and better than you. Um, And I think that was kind of this wake-up call for her. She needed someone to kind of stand up to her. Um, Then, uh, you know, because of everything that happened with her mom. So then, you know, it's interesting. We finally go to Ohio and um, she reconnects with Benny. Um, who she played at the U.S. Open in Las Vegas uh, in episode three. So um, they start to form this relationship, and you kind of get a little bit of romance, you know, vibes from them, which was interesting because uh, they worked together in in a weird way, which is kind of funny. Um, but Benny hustles her at speed chess, and they knew that at the end they were going to end up, you know, facing off. Originally, she didn't want to face him, but she ends up losing all of her money. And in a typical Beth fashion, she gets very angry when she loses. But she's also determined, which is kind of why she continued to bet on everything. Um, but the interesting thing is, is despite her losing to Benny, um, she learned from it. And this is kind of what I was saying in the, the previous podcast about the Queen's Gambit. It almost reminds me of like this, you know, Goku, Vegeta, Saiyan sort of situation in which they they actually grow as warriors and beth grows as a player through defeat more so than defeat um you know they can train as much as they want but at the end of the day you know their their skills are only going to improve so much they they kind of have to lose in different ways to learn how to improve themselves so it's very interesting the way that that worked out um and then um Yeah, so she ends up beating Benny um, after he demolished her like 100 times in speed chess. But for Beth, I guess that's a whole different animal. Benny's really good at speed chess. Um, They end up going to the bar after her victory, and she kind of tries to flirt with him in a really awkward way, which is really funny, and Benny's like, uh, no. And you're also pounding back your drinks like way too much, which kind of once again plays into her whole pills and alcohol addiction. Um, And he's like, look... You have the Paris Invitational coming up, and in addition to that, you also have um, the Moscow Invitational, which is where the world champion would be playing, uh, which he'd also be playing in France as well. Um, But even more so, like, come to me to New York, and I'm going to train you. I will mentor you. You'll have a place in my living room. And so that's kind of where the episode ends, and then the whole uh, first half of the next episode is the mentorship, and she ends up sleeping on this, like, crappy blow-up mattress in his, like, basement studio apartment. Um, He does not want a romantic relationship with her because he is focused on chess. That's his whole life, too. But also... um, as the episode progresses, you kind of actually do see that Benny's very impressed, and that kind of... Uh, turns them on, you know, and it's really, it's really interesting to see their whole relationship play out. But that whole uh, portion of their relationship really comes into play when he invites two uh, grand champions over, or one of them I think was a grand champion, the other one was just a really talented chess player. And then this girl, this kind of tag-along girl, Cleo, who I guess Benny's sort of had some sort of relationship with in the past. Um, So Beth kind of makes her first, like, girlfriend, aside from Jolene, who, uh, as you guys may or may not remember, was her friend in the orphanage who was much older than her. So, anyway, they decide to play speed chess, uh, three games of speed chess, and I guess it's not so much speed chess for the other people as it is for Beth, though, um, because the other people have time to wait as Beth is making her moves against the other people. But anyway, um, she beats them all. She destroys them all, even Benny, and they all play for money, and Benny loses and loses, but Benny knows when to stop, whereas Beth kind of doesn't know when to stop, generally speaking. Um, but after they all left, that's when uh, 
you know, they end up sleeping together. But the ironic or the funny part of it all is, is after they're done, Beth kind of has a, a glow about her. Um, and she, she says a line where she's like, oh, that's what that's supposed to feel like. Um, cause she slept with Harry Beltic a, a few times and she slept with some like random, like college student. Um, I don't know. I think it was like episode three, maybe. Um, so it was just really funny to see that, but it, <laughs> Benny is just so focused on chess that he immediately starts talking about chess, like, like not even 15 seconds after they're done sleeping together. Um, she gets a little mad about that and the mood's ruined. Um, but anyway, Fast forward to the Paris Invitational, she crushes everyone there, and she makes it to the final round where she's going to face Borgov again. Uh, she faced him in Mexico, and he beat her. Now she's ready to face him here. And so um, she ends up running into Leo, or Cleo, at the Paris Invitational, the girl that she had met at Benny's apartment, you know, like probably a couple weeks beforehand. And Cleo kind of pushes Beth to do drugs and, you know, drink some alcohol, because when she was with Benny, she had stopped all that. Benny actually got her to sort of improve as a person, which is another reason why I kind of like their relationship. They, you know, at least he got her to better herself. Um, but Cleo kind of got her to cave in, and there's a very interesting line about, you know, someone that Beth loves. Now, you're pretty sure that, you know, they're not talking about Benny. Uh, it, it makes it really seem like Beth is talking about Towns, which I don't quite get that. That might be different in the book, um, because the Towns relationship is not very well flushed out in this show. Um, you know, they, they had a little bit of an interaction at their first tournament, and then they had an interaction at, um, I keep mixing up if it's Mexico or Vegas, but I'm 99% sure thinking back on it, it is definitely Vegas. Um, you know, but that's when you get the hint that Towns is gay. So she makes, she makes a, you know, a, a comment about how she's in love with him, but she's like 16 years old and he was definitely in his thirties. Um, so now with her being like three to five years older, he's got to be in his mid to late 30s, you know, getting close to 40. But anyway, so then this is where the show picks up. Um, or this is where the show gets to where it originally started, because it started in media res. Um, for those who don't know, in media res means, like, in the middle of the action. It's a film, you know, writing technique in which, um, in, in a sense, to hook your audience, you start in the middle of something crazy. A lot of film noir um, movies used to do that. Uh, they used to do it like, oh, someone's shot and they're dying. And then you go back and you find out how you got to that point. But anyway, she woke up super late. She was hung over. She was taking pills and she lost her match to Borgov. And then she hit a real low point because this is where she wanted to win, uh, which then brings us to her being back home. And she is even more of a mess because now she has no one. Um, and I believe Harry tried to reach out to her a couple times, and she was ignoring him because she was just in a really dark place. But someone knocks on the door, and it's Jolene. And that's how the episode ends. And then in the finale, you know, you had a really cool, interesting relationship with Jolene. And it was funny because at the beginning of that episode, episode 6, I was saying to my family, because we all watched it together, I was like... You know, we haven't seen Jolene since episode two. Like, what's going on? Like, you would think that she'd have a bigger role to play. And then, lo and behold, she did show up. So it's very interesting. Jolene, uh, you know, she kind of made a name for herself. Uh, she was working in, I believe, uh, n the newspaper or the print, you know, and marketing agency. And, I mean, that's got to be hard for a black woman in the late 60s, you know. But she's, you know, working her way up. And she's... Um, I believe she was in a biracial relationship with, you know, someone who was also higher up, so she's got a little bit of money in her life too now, which factors into, you know, uh, Beth's current problem, um, which is she, her last chance as of now to beat Borgoff before it's probably a really long time before she gets a chance again, is at the Moscow Invitational, and so she's desperate for money, and so she tries to hit up the uh, church people, but then... 
they want her to do this, that, and the other, and she doesn't want to do it. And then they're like, well, we paid for a lot of your trips, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then she writes them a huge check paying them back, which pretty much bankrupts her. And um, she ends up buying the house from the um, ex-adoptive father, I guess you can say, even though he's never really in her life at all. Um, She's just making a lot of bad decisions. Um, And and actually, this all happened at at the end of episode 6 before Jolene came into play. But anyway, the reason why Jolene was coming back into the picture is because Mr. Scheibel had died. And so they go to his funeral. It's kind of a sad funeral, um, you know, not talking about the sense that he's dead, which is obviously very sad, but more so because there's no one there. And he didn't really have anyone in his life. And he made such a great uh, impression on Beth's life. And so they go to the orphanage, and Beth kind of sneaks into the basement where his, you know, office was and finds out that this entire time Mr. Scheibel had been following her whole career. Even the note when she borrowed the 10 bucks to enter her first tournament that she was supposed to pay back, uh, he kept it. He kept it all, and he followed her. And it was really upsetting for her, but I think it was really cathartic for her, and it was that final drive to get her to, you know, have that desire again to play and to go to the Moscow Invitational. Um, she tries to get money from Benny as well, but Benny refuses, and uh, Jolene then loans her the money. And it's a lot of money to fly to Moscow and for all the expenses there. Um, she ends up getting in contact with the government as well because she's going to kind of need an aid when she's over there. Because once again, as I you know kind of set the set the tone for everything, it all deals with. Um, you know, this is during the Cold War, and you had, you know, the whole scare with communism, and she was an, just an American girl. could be very dangerous for her, so they send a representative over there. Um, but it's interesting, once she's finally over there, she destroys everyone, and after each match, her fan base grows and grows and grows and grows and grows, because also keep in mind that she's, like, the only female player to really play. Um... But yeah, so it's just really interesting. Um, and then she finally gets to her final match, and it's Borgov. And she starts with the Queen's Gambit, which is, you know, obviously the name of the show. Um, and, you know, I said it before, the Queen's Gambit is one of the oldest chess openings. Um, it's kind of you sacrifice your one pawn in the beginning of the game because you know Black is going to take the pawn and then it puts them sort of at a disadvantage uh, starting out. It's the only way um, to really keep, I I guess, you know, from my limited understanding, it's your way to keep the advantage. Uh, Because white, even if you play an equally good game between white and black, white always has the advantage because they have the first move. But anyway, so their match ends up going on for a really long time, and they have to adjourn for the day. And she's all in, you know, she's in Moscow all by herself. And um, she's got no one, and she even sees that all the great chess players are analyzing her game together in a room so Borgov can beat her. She goes back to her room, and she gets a call from Benny. And it's not just from Benny. It's, or more specifically, sorry because I forgot this detail, but Towns was at the Moscow Invitational, and it's the third time you've now seen him in the series, and he kind of apologizes for his boyfriend kind of coming in the room when they originally were talking and taking photos Um, but he gives Beth the phone and it's Benny and it's the twins and it's Harry and it's all of her friends that she's had, uh, minus Jolene because they don't know Jolene. And so you get this really nice little ending. She's, you know, she has friends down. She has kind of a bit of purpose in her life and she's come to accept things. And so she goes back the next day and she beats Borgoff and now she is the world champion. As she's headed to the airport, um, she's in this interesting little outfit, which I don't know if anyone caught it, but the outfit she's in is uh, resembles the White Queen. And, you know, for the chess opening of the Queen's Gambit, which you got to be white to do it, um, she she played that and she was the queen. So and now she's the queen of the world <laughs> for the chess uh, community. So it's just really interesting. It was a nice little fitting ending to the show. I felt like the show really was going to have a tragic ending, but it didn't end up having a tragic ending at all. Um, One other little thing, too. I never read the book, but from what I do know of the book, uh, ever since Beth left the orphanage in the book, 
up until the point where Mr. Scheibel died, there actually was one instance where they end up seeing each other in between that whole time. Um, I don't know what happens, but I just know that they do end up seeing each other. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, from at least the limited information that I'm going off of, I actually like the way that it occurred in the show because that death and her finding out about his following of her, I feel like it hits much harder in a very different way than if they would have ran into each other at some point. Because he's very emotionless, generally. He's a pretty logical person. And he's kind of got, he's a, a one-note emotional, you know, emotionless character, so. But you can't deny his uh, role in the whole story that played out. Anyway, on that note, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be talking about the new sitcom, Home Economics. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. All right, and we are back. So we started off the podcast with Little Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Then we moved on to the Queen's Gambit, episodes 5 through 7. So we are completely done with our Queen's Gambit segments, as it was a miniseries. Then we now are moving on to Home Economics. So... For those who don't know, Home Economics started on April 7th of this year. Um, it airs on Wednesdays at 8.30. Uh, we have only had two episodes so far, and I've actually only seen the pilot. So as of now, we're really only going to be talking about the general premise and pilot of this show. I'm not sure if I also just said it, but it airs on ABC. So you can watch it on cable or you can watch it online or streaming service like Hulu. So, uh, once again, Home Economics is a brand new sitcom. It is about three siblings, but more specifically, three adult siblings. They're all in their, uh, probably say, anywhere from mm, early 30s to very early 40s, if I had to guess. Uh, they don't actually discuss their ages, uh, but I'm just kind of basing it off of the actors and the children that they all have in the show. So, once again, uh, we have three adult siblings. The whole show is about their relationship along with their various positions within the uh, economic um, brackets. So, we have one sibling that is upper class, kind of like more so like a one percenter. We have another sibling that is very much middle class, or at least they're presented as middle class, but I'd imagine they're more along the lines of like upper middle class, but starting to drop a bit. And then we have a lower class family as well. So uh, the three main stars of this show are Topher Grace, uh, who plays a character named Tom. He pretty much is the uh, central character in this show, and I'm sure everyone knows, but um, I'll just kind of go through each of the actors as well. But Topher Grace, most people know him from that 70s show. He also was in Spider-Man as well. Uh, he played uh, Eddie, uh, Eddie Brock, or Venom, in the third Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie. 
He also, um, in the more recent years, was on uh, Black Klansman, uh, which he played, I believe, the head member of the KKK. Um, But yeah, it was just really interesting when I saw this show uh, being advertised, because the advertisement really caught my eye. I don't usually really watch a lot of commercials or anything, because I'm usually watching, you know, things on Hulu or Netflix or whatever, especially a lot of my cable shows I prefer to watch on Hulu. Just no commercials, no need to fast forward. It's all there. It's all saved for me. But, um... But yeah, I saw the commercial the one day when I was watching TV. It was in March. It was like pretty much the only home economics commercial that was playing. Um, It was uh, he and the other main actors in the show. They're all sitting around like a conference table and they're, you know, talking about the uh, various designs for the logo and advertisement for the show for marketing. And so they go through all these designs and it's all other like really famous sitcoms. So like the number one thing that caught my eye was the Modern Family logo, which is the whole reason why I actually rewound to the commercial to see it. And so I was like, oh, wow, this is interesting. And that one actor looks really familiar, uh, Jimmy uh, Tatro, or however you say his name. I was like, he looks really familiar. I couldn't remember his name at that point in time. But I was like, Topher Grace, wow. Like, what has Topher done in the past, like, five to ten years? I feel like I haven't really seen him in anything. And I kind of forgot that he was even in Black's Cl- uh, Black Klansman, which came out in 2018? Maybe 2019, but I think it was 2018. But anyway, um, yeah, so I was just like, all right, it's piqued my interest. I know nothing of this show, but I know Topher Grace, and I'm just kind of curious, what, what, what does he do as an actor nowadays? You know, has his abilities even evolved? Not to say that he was ever a bad actor, but anyway, um... So, once again, Topher Grace plays Tom. He is, like, the main character of the show, even though it's also, yet again, another bit of an ensemble-ish cast. Um, He is characterized as a middle-class author. He's struggling, not only as an author, but a little bit financially as well. He's the oldest child of the three of them. Uh, He's married to... The character's name is Marina... Uh, who is from Mexico, um, or at least she has, you know, Mexican heritage in her. And they also have, I think, three kids. So, uh, with the youngest one being like somewhere within about a year old, if I had to guess. So that's his character. He's a struggling author. Um, his He used to be a really big best-selling novelist, and his last book just completely tanked. But he keeps up the persona that he's like, you know, this, you know, big shot. Um, and his wife used to be a lawyer at a pretty big firm, but she quit her job, I think, in part, to be a stay-at-home mom. They don't really go into it that much in the first episode. Um, so if she was working and he was continuously writing and making money off, uh, of that, of like his big novels, then they would definitely be upper class. But like I said, I'm going to characterize them as upper middle class. Then, uh, the next character we have is Caitlin, or the character's name is Sarah, played by Caitlin McGee. She is the middle child. Um, she was a child therapist. Um, and she worked, uh, from my understanding from the pilot, she worked for the school district, um, or she was trying to become a child therapist in the school district, but she might have just been a regular child therapist. Once again, only going off the pilot, so I don't have all the information here, um, as I'm sure as the show goes on, they'll release more. But anyway, um, her and her wife she's a lesbian, um, they're definitely lower class, they pretty much live in a studio apartment, their second floor, so to speak, is just like a built-in loft where, uh, their two kids sleep at. Um, now, her wife is played by, uh, and I might butcher her name, Shazir Zamata, um, who I don't know anything she's done except for the, like, three or four years she was on Saturday Night Live as one of the comedians. Um, so her wife is black also, and their children are black. 
So, um, it's a little weird that they're the lower class family, but I don't know what her wife does. Um, I don't really think they, uh, they said that in the pilot. But anyway, moving on to the third sibling, we have, um, Connor, who is played by Jimmy Tatro. Um, he's the youngest sibling. He owns a private equity firm, and he has one kid, Gretchen. So, Tom has three kids, Sarah has two kids, Connor has one kid. And, um, he has a wife as well, and once again, he's super rich, upper class, uh, kind of like a one percenter sort of, you know, person. He just bought a brand new house, like, Riverside in San Francisco, because you can see the Golden Gate Bridge, um, in the background, uh, his house is, like, ridiculously nice, he's always, like, kind of, like, showboating about his money, but in my mind, it's not really in an obnoxious way, although the siblings take it as a very obnoxious way, it's almost like a, a running joke for them, um, but I guess it used to be Matt Damon's house, that was, like, the big thing. So, uh, his wife is not shown in the first episode, um, so we don't really know who, you know, she is, um, but anyway, so... They're all kind of presenting this image that their lives, are, their lives are all together. You know, Tom still is pretending that he is, you know, this big um, best-selling author, and Caitlin still, you know, is presenting the image that she's not broke, jobless. You know, that she still is a child therapist. And then Connor, on the other hand, which that revelation's interesting towards the end of the episode, um, his wife has left him, which is something they kind of hint to in the beginning of the episode once the children finally meet up. Um, so none of them are perfect. They're all flawed. They're all having their own issues. I think this show did a really good job of setting up all three characters, um, which I actually forgot to tell you a little bit about the other two main actors, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I think they do a really good job of of setting up the humor, setting up the character dynamics between the siblings, uh, setting up that each of them are very flawed. Um, you know, as I said, even in my first segment about Falcon and the Winter Soldier, you know, like, Sam is too much of a, like, hero hero. He's like a moral compass. That type of character... I mean, some people still really like those characters, don't get me wrong, but those type of characters are really boring. They're not very dimensional, and oftentimes people, whether they know they want to or not, people want characters that are flawed. It makes them relatable. It, it's exactly what makes them, or people root for those types of characters. You know, and that's something you really see in a lot of a lot of these new shows, uh, you know, that really focuses on anti-heroes. I mean, and you can really give that credit to, like, um, The Sopranos back in the 90s, you know, for really making that a big thing. And then I feel like there was a huge rush of it with Breaking Bad in the early 2010s. But anyway, I don't want to get too far off subject. So, so yeah, so you have these flawed characters, and you have their, their very interesting dynamic. It feels very, very much like they are siblings. So I want to just kind of jump back really quick. Caitlin McGee, uh, to my knowledge, she hasn't really done a whole lot of things. She was in Bluff City Law and Mythic Quest. Um, it's pretty much it. She's been in a lot of other stuff too, but not as a main role or a reoccurring role. It's been like, oh, she was in that one episode of Grey's Anatomy that no one remembers. You know, something like that. Uh, Jimmy Tatro, uh, He's had a couple bigger roles, but also he's had a bunch of little roles too, similar to Caitlin McGee. Um, most notably, he was uh, a character in the Grown Ups movie. He was, um, I believe he was one of the college students in 22 Jump Street. He was uh, one of the main uh, actors in the American Vandal show for the first season. Still have yet to see that show, but, you know, thinking about it, I might actually watch that now because I'm watching him in this show. Uh, he was in Modern Family for about six episodes. He was the firefighter who was dating uh, Alex. Um, and then he was also in the YouTube series, uh, The Real Bros of Sim Simi Valley, if that's how you say it, 
uh, which is actually probably one of the more, you know, first things that I knew him from. I feel like his YouTube presence, I feel like he was also on Vine too, but his YouTube presence is actually really what uh, blew up his career. And he writes and he produces and stuff a lot too. Anyway, so um, there's only been two episodes so far. It's Each episode has been averaging on about 3 million views, which is pretty good. Um, you also have uh, another couple of the characters, too, that I, I forgot to mention are the parents. They only made, like, two appearances in the show. Um, the parents feel very much... kind of your typical parents in a sense or at least what's portrayed as your very standard parents um with a like hint of racial insensitivity i'm not going to say they're racist because that there's no evidence that supports that at all but it's just like their little comments about like how excited they are about like having like a black daughter-in-law and a mexican daughter-in-law and like you know this that and, and you know black grandchildren and stuff like that and biracial grandchildren um, you know, all around. So they, they kind of make comments about that. Um, you know, like I said, they're only really in like two scenes. So, but they also seem to be like, they'll, they'll get disappointed in things, but they'll deliver in a way that the kids know they're saying it. So the kids know, but also, so they're not directly saying it, which is based on like the ending skit, which you could see if you have, if you haven't seen the episode, I'll just watch the episode. You'll see it at the end. But anyway, so just like a li- little bit of like weird comments in that regard. Um, so, but I really, I really actually liked this show. I, I think I could see the show being around for a while, you know, having consistent, uh, 3 million viewers from the pilot to the second episode is pretty good. Cause sometimes you'll see like a pretty big drop off from the first to second episode. Um, and then, you know, if a show still does really well, then you might see an increase again, uh, if there's an initial drop between the first three episodes. Uh, but I really like it. It's got a really diverse cast. It's got a somewhat standard story, but still very much relatable to with real world problems, but nice little comedic bits, especially with, you know, three grown adults riding three kids cars down, you know, the road. Uh, which that joke doesn't make sense unless you watch it. So I'm curious to see where the show is going to go. And I, I kind of have higher expectations. I don't know if it'll be a great sitcom like Modern Family, but I don't think it'll fade into oblivion, at least not anytime soon. So anyway, on that note, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back for our final segment where we'll be talking about The Circle, Season 2, Episode 2. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. All right, and we are back. So, we have already talked about Falcon and the Winter Soldier. We have finished talking about the miniseries or limited series, The Queen's Gambit, episodes 5 through 7. And we have talked about a brief overview and the pilot of Home Economics. So, now we're going to be shifting gears and to our final segment, where we'll be talking about Netflix's online... or sorry, not online, but their reality competition, The Circle. So I already covered episode one of season two so far, and now we'll be shifting gears to episode two of The Circle. Now they do drop them out uh, at four episodes at a time each week until pretty much, I'm assuming, the end of the month. Um, So I imagine there will be somewhere around 12 to 16 episodes 
But, um, yeah, I was only, I've only been able to really watch one episode at a time, um, but I'm going to get caught up and start talking about them in larger chunks, so probably two episodes for each podcast, just to kind of keep up with the general, um, you know, just of what's going on in the show, because I'm sure most people who have watched The Circle, they're probably not watching it as slowly as me. They're probably watching, you know, all four episodes in one sitting. So anyway, uh, as episode two uh, left off right, or episode two started right where episode one left off, where we had both of the influencers, Tara Leisha and Savannah, who were able to save one contestant each. And so, um, as we know from the previous episode, there was this all-girls alliance in which they wanted to stay strong, girl power, which is really cool to see because you don't often get that a lot from these reality competitions. So, Tara Leisha decided that she was going to save Emily, which, as we actually know, Emily is a catfish. Um, then, on the other hand, we have Savannah, who, uh, right towards the end of episode one, Savannah managed to have a heart-to-heart conversation with Trevor, and they had a conversation, you know, about being raised and raising a child in a single-parent household, and so it really hooked Savannah in. Now, among all the players that have been in the season so far, Savannah and Tara Leisha, I do think, are two of the better contenders in this game, and I was really thinking that Savannah, you know, might have the chops to win it all. Tara Leisha, I think she'll make it pretty far, but I think people might, might recognize her as a smart and good player, and she might get taken out before the very end. Either way, I would love to see both of these women go really far into the game, if not win it. But anyway, so it kind of upset Chloe a little bit that Savannah saved a guy and not her. And, um, you know, so Chloe bringing the drama, she you know, started a group chat with Emily and was kind of venting about everything. And then Emily, who is once again a catfish, um, you know, is just kind of like, cool, I'm in a good position. Not only was I saved, but I'm also in this group chat. And so, I mean, they don't really need to add me into this group chat because this is going to be mostly an A and B conversation. So it's just really funny to see him just kind of like relish in this, you know, drama because he's watching it play out, but he's not actively involved in it. But the drama itself was actually pretty contained, but the crazy thing was, instead of starting a whole new group chat, he just added Savannah into the group chat, which gives her access to all the previous history, so she could just easily read up that, hmm, these two were in a private chat, and then they added me? It's just a huge mistake, especially if you play any sort of online reality competition. You know that is such a (laughs) oh gosh it is such a big mistake oh it makes me cringe anyway so um that was probably really like all that was really noteworthy in the very beginning and I guess once again you know I think Emily has uh socially put herself in one of the best situations so moving on we had a little um you know fun social stir segment in which um, the people who were eligible to be blocked from the circle, they all did poems. So, started off with Courtney's poem, and they only had 15 minutes to do this challenge, and I was thinking to myself while watching this, like, damn, like, I don't really think I would do that good, like, I could probably write a poem if I... If I had the time, I think I could write a decent poem. It wouldn't be a masterpiece, but I don't think it would necessarily be horrible. I don't know if 15 minutes would be enough for me, though. But granted, when you're stuck in that house and it's the only thing you have to do, you know, I guess you're going to do anything to, you know, um, get rid of that boredom. So Courtney went up first, and Courtney read their poem, and he... Um, he had a good poem. It was good, very standard, almost kind of feels like something I might write, you know, it wasn't, you know, yeah, it was just very average, very standard. Um, and people liked it, and I think he got, like, probably an average of a B's across the board, and I think the, the total grades you could give, you can give an A, a B, a C, or an F. 
Um, but yeah, I'd say Courtney averaged about Bs, which is all good. And then you had River that went up. Now, River obviously is another catfish. River is a um, 50-year-old man playing a 20-year-old gay guy, um, which uh, the actual person playing River is also gay himself, and he kind of uses... He uses his friend, but he also uses his inspiration of when he was younger. And he's also a writer, so he's good at making, you know, stuff up. And wow. Like, I I was stunned. River's poem was was seriously something that you would read from, like, a uh, an old, you know, classic poem or just a poem book or something you'd learn in literature. Like, it was really good. The issue with uh, River's poem was it wasn't very personal because obviously these poems, uh, or not obviously, because if you haven't seen it um, and you're only hearing it from me for some reason, like, you had to cater to one of the influencers. Like, this is kind of like your last-ditch effort. Um, so, anyway, um, yeah, so River's poem was not very personal, but it was really, really, really well-written. Um, and I think people recognize that, and so... You add a couple of A's, and then Savannah, Savannah, man, she was bringing the low grades for a lot of people. She was a very harsh critic. Maybe a little too harsh. Um, yeah, you kind of do want to be honest, and you want to you know, grade things fairly, but you don't want to be known as the person who gave everyone low scores while everyone was being more lenient. So, um, but yeah, amazing poem. Just absolutely stunned, but not very personal. Uh, which actually I completely skipped over. The second person to actually go was Chloe. Chloe's poem was really fun, really well written too, uh, but not well written, you know, eloquently like Rivers was, but it was done like kind of in the style of a rap and a lot of people really meshed well with it. And it was, it was just all around fun. Like I, I really enjoyed it. I, you know, popped a smirk, you know, watching the scene play out. And then I started even chuckling towards the end. Uh, but Tara Alicia really enjoyed it. It seemed like, uh, Savannah once again was a very harsh critic. Um, you know, you had some A's, but then you had, I think maybe like a C from Chloe. And so Chloe's just like, Oh, Savannah does not like me, which just puts a further rift between those, those two. Then you had Bryant. Bryant finished, uh, every, uh, the, finished the poems. And, um, I liked uh, Bryant, but he was a little too much. Um, it was like met in some areas and then good in others. It was kind of personal and very uh, more so for himself, um, but also a little personal towards the other people too. So Brian probably got, I think Brian got the lowest score. Uh, so after the poems, uh, Bryant made a good connection with uh, Tara Alicia. Um, and, you know, talking about like, um, you know, their, their personal life and his, you know, addiction and how he changes life around and all breathing techniques, stuff like that. So he made a really good connection with Tara Alicia. Uh, Brian also, Brian and River made a really good connection and, you know, you could kind of see that if River was real, they would probably be sort of along the lines of, uh, kindred spirits. So that was kind of funny to uh, see play out, um, and they they also made a good connection. Um, then you had River, who started a private conversation with Tara Alicia. Now, personally, I think River went a little overboard, and it's not exactly how I would have envisioned River's character to be. Um, at least, you know, from my thoughts about who River was as a person or what was being presented. And River was, like, super heartbroken and, you know, was broken up, like, a week before the circle and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, he really needed, you know, an emotional support and a, and a big sister, as he put it. So Tara Alicia actually kind of ate it up. Um, and I was a little stunned. I really thought that Tara Alicia would have kind of seen through it because I think Tara Alicia is probably one of the smartest players in the game. Um, but she didn't. And... Yeah, I mean, just kind of very interesting uh, that they ended up making this big bond. Um, So we're getting, at this point in the episode, we're getting pretty close to the point in which, um, you know, someone's going to be blocked. And so 
Tara Leash and Savannah, they get to go to their little private hangout room so they can discuss the contestants in a different setting, and there's wine, and there's food, and they have conversations about each of the people. So at this point in time, I wrote down my prediction, and I said that I thought it was going to be Chloe or River. Uh, Chloe, because there is definitely a rift uh, between you know Savannah and Chloe, and in addition to that... Um, Chloe definitely is flirting with Trevor, and she can easily flirt with any of the guys, although you know it's not going to flirt with River, and uh, she's not going to have the easiest time flirting with Bryant as well, um, and Courtney as well. Um, so Trevor's her main, you know, her main squeeze, and if any other guys come in, then she'll probably try and flirt with them to build these relationships. So she poses a pretty big social threat. So that's why I was thinking her. As for River, River has been... I actually really like the catfish who's playing River, but River is been a little less active than the rest of the cast, and so, I don't know, I was just expecting the, the connections and, you know, uh, the guy who's playing him to be a little out of touch with everyone. Um, so they kind of run through it and Savannah fights way too hard for Courtney. Um, and she just showed all of her cards. And so Tara Leisha was able to clock her in that, as she thought Courtney was going to be a big threat. And Savannah has already formed that bond with, um, Cl uh, Courtney. So Tara Leisha is skeptical. And then, um... They kind of continue to talk about the rest of the people, and, you know, they come to Chloe, and they're like, well, there is the Girls' Alliance, and uh, we're, we're all about girl power, and I feel like it's genuine, and, you know, blah, 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 all this kind of crap. So then it leaves Bryant and River, and I was still kind of leaning towards River, but um, but I was like, you never know. And I, I had did not have high hopes for Bryant when I watched the first episode, too. And so they finally um, get to the the announcement, and it's Bryant. Bryant leaves the circle. He's been blocked. And so you see um, River, the catfish who plays River, um, is literally crying and picks up his, like, sticky notes that he puts on his fridge about each of the players, and he just looks at it, and he's like, I can't believe I'm crying. Um, and so I was just like, wow. Like, I'm stunned that he was crying that much, and I guess maybe he was kind of banking on him being, you know, his number one ally. Um, I just feel like it's risky playing those types of characters in a game that seems like it's on the more vapid side. But anyway, um, so I, at that point, wrote down a prediction, you know, based off the way the edit was going, and I was like, Brian has to go see River. Um, otherwise, I don't think they would hark on, because they, they dip into each of the characters, but I didn't think that they would hark on that too much if it wasn't going to be River, and it was, and... He was fine. Uh, Bryant was completely fine with River being the catfish, and um, they still had this little moment, and Bryant's a little awkward, and he's like, come here, like, let me hold your hand, and stuff like that, because he's just very sensitive and in touch with his feelings. It just it just seems really weird, cause especially for someone you don't know, but, um, you know, if if you know someone, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but I personally would not do that to someone who I didn't actually know, because um, they only got to know each other for, like, a day, and even then... We don't really know how long these conversations are, um, you know, because some of these conversations, they seem like they're condensed in the edit um, because the conversations are short. If it were me, I'd be having much longer conversations with these people to get to know them because I myself, like I, when I play these types of games online, I want to know the people for who they are as people. And then from there, that drives me to to hopefully build relationships that are on something more genuine rather than necessity. But anyway, so he left the circle, and the episode ends with the announcement of the new person, and it's freaking Lance Bass. Oh my god, I started cracking up. I was like, I had no clue there was going to be an actual celebrity in this show. And um, then Chloe is like, oh, he's cute. Like, I'm going to flirt with him. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. Everyone else knows who he is, clearly, and you do not. This is going to be... <laughs> this is going to be a big treat the next episode when she discovers uh, who he is. But anyway, um, that made me laugh at the end. 
But that's pretty much it for the second episode of The Circle. But uh, thank you for listening to the GSMC Television Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to please ask you that you uh, remember to subscribe to the show, write a nice little review because it really helps us out. And also, if you could please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and have a wonderful day. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.